Okay, so welcome back to those of you who were with us in the last session and uh, welcome for the first time who are joining us just for these introductory lectures for the first time. <clears throat> um, we've, we've got kind of a, a tight schedule, so I'm gonna keep my introductions um, fairly brief if the presenters want to, to add on them, uh, bring up um, points about their backgrounds that are particularly relevant for, for their particular such a session, they're welcome to do so. I'm going to link um, Professor Christiansen's academic page in the, in the Zoom room. So you can find that there now. But uh, Professor Christiansen is um, a professor of character education and virtue ethics at, in the School of Education at the University of Birmingham. Um, it's a very unique uh, research center in the world um, in terms of kind of bringing to bear modern um, empirical approaches, especially in the social sciences, to, to understanding how virtues function, maybe particularly from uh, a neo-Aristotelian um, viewpoint. Um, so, like I said, that's how they, they typically approach the virtues, as I understand it. Um, but we are fortunate today to have um, Professor Christiansen bring his expertise to, to bear on sort of um, various accounts of the concept of flourishing. So we'll get sort of a, a broad overview and um, his ideas for sort of some remaining problems for, for understanding or, or increasing flourishing through education. So with all for me, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Did yes. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike, and, and thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you to all the organizers of this, this wonderful conference and, and this wonderful sort of new society in the making. And um, yeah, thank you for inviting me to give this introductory lecture. It's uh, based mainly on my book, which came out in 2020 called Flourishing as the Aim of Education. Uh, Fortunately, this book has now just been released in a paperback edition, so it's actually affordable, which it wasn't actually before when it was only available in hardback. Um, and I will be talking through some of the themes in this book and adding, adding some more as, as we go along. So talking about different accounts of flourishing in an, an educational context and some remaining problems that sort of uh, bedevil these, all these accounts. Uh, Oops. Yeah, so I'll just let me start by saying something about myself and the center where I work before I, I start the actual presentation. So I work in the Jubilee Center for Character and Virtues, like, like Mike said, uh, which is the largest uh, research center in the world dedicated to uh, a study of character strengths and virtues and indeed flourishing as well, uh, with over 20 members of staff. And we are an ER Aristotelian center, but we also work closely with people with different academic backgrounds. For example, we work quite a lot with people from the positive psychology and positive education movements as well. We produced a lot of materials uh, and videos. The, the videos you can our videos you can find on the YouTube web if you search for Jubilee Center. Uh, and all our materials, teaching materials, etc., are available free to download from our web page. Uh, we run, a, or we, we founded a, a secondary school in, in Birmingham as well, University of Birmingham School, which was designed by us from scratch, including the architecture uh, and the, the architecture and the whole structure of the school and the curriculum is sort of geared towards a school that foregrounds character strengths and, and virtues and indeed well-being and flourishing uh, in a holistic sense. And we also run the world's only uh, fully online master's program in character education, uh, which is getting increasingly popular and is actually over, oversubscribed, uh, although we're taking 50 new students every year. So that was a bit about the background and the, the center. Now to the main topic of the day, which is flourishing. This is actually quite an interesting topic, not only academically, but also practically, uh, because at the moment, 
OECD, the education department of OECD, which uh, organizes and uh, carries out every year the, the famous PISA uh, surveys and PISA comparisons of school systems all around the world, is seriously thinking about incorporating some kind of a, a well-being or indeed a flourishing measure into its uh, PISA surveys in the future. And they're considering now what kind of measures to use to, to sort of test or to evaluate flourishing around the world. And the, the incentive for this actually comes from some of the countries who usually score highest in these tests like South Korea and Taiwan, uh, Japan, uh, because they are not very happy about the mental health of the students and they say, well, yeah, we score really high in the PISA tests of uh, literacy and science every year, but there is something wrong with the well-being of our students. So OECD is, is considering this possibility. And they are interested in this bandwagon of flourishing in education, which has been uh, sort of in motion now for about 15 to 20 years. Uh, it's become a, a really popular paradigm. Uh, uh, actually, both on this side of the Atlantic and also in, in the States. So in the States, Harry Brickhouse, who's a well-known educational philosopher, talks about the purpose of education being to promote human flourishing. In the UK, John White, an eminent uh, educational philosopher, talks about schools as seed beds of human flourishing. And in the Netherlands, Dorit de Ruiter uh, has written about the universal hopes of parents that their children will lead a flourishing life. So this is all fine and well, but there are various sort of issues with this flourishing paradigm, although I am in general in favor of it. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a new Aristotelian paradigm originally because Aristotle was the first person to talk about flourishing or eudaimonia as the, the aim of not only education, but life in general. But there are various problems that we need to uh, think about. Uh, for the first problem is that if we look at all these educational thinkers, they, they are not, most of them are not Aristotelians. Uh, for example, uh, Brickhouse, White, and De Rutre would probably identify as liberal thinkers rather than Aristotelian thinkers. And that is a bit of a problem in the sense that uh, Aristotelianism and liberalism are very different uh, philosophies in a way, or, more, or they've got very different views of morality, for example. Aristotelians, for example, believe in a very large set of universal human values and virtues. They think compassion and justice and honesty and various other moral and intellectual and civic virtues are universal, whereas liberals tend to have a very sort of small core of, of universal interhuman virtues that they believe in, mainly liberty, uh, freedom, autonomy, tolerance. And they think that a lot of the other virtues and values are more culture rel relative or culture specific. So this is a big difference. And now to complicate things even further, there are two other groups of educationists uh, who have written a lot about flourishing recently. Uh, so within self-determination theory in psychology that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Ryan and DC have written a lot about flourishing. And then finally, the fourth group, are the positive psychologists like Martin Seligman, who wrote his famous book, his famous bestseller on flourish in 2011. So the second problem is, how do these groups differ in their understanding of flourishing? And is the common language worrisome? I mean, one always becomes a bit suspicious when people from very, very different academic and philosophical backgrounds seem to be talking about and celebrating the same ideal. Is it really the same ideal they are celebrating or not? Before I talk about the differences between the approaches, it's, it's worth mentioning that actually they do agree on various of the fundamental conceptual issues. So I think all these four groups, they agree that flourishing is an objective account of well-being. They agree that there are actually two main categories of well-being accounts, subjective and objective. Uh, the subjective accounts, they see the criteria of well-being being subjective in the sense of having to do with psychological states or experiences or feelings. Uh, and then these are traditionally divided up into hedonic accounts, which understand well-being simply in terms of pleasure and life satisfaction accounts, which understand well-being in terms of uh, the ratio between 
one's uh, aspirations and one's accomplishments. And these subjective accounts, they've got sort of traditional problems attached to them. Uh, the problem with the hedonic account is the standard problem of the happiness pill. Would you really want to say that the person who is pleased from morning to night because he's taking a, a wonderful pill, would you really say that person is enjoying well-being? And then the problem with the life satisfaction accounts is that it seems that if you just lower your expectations and aspirations, then you would score very high on well-being. So for example, the, the well-attuned, the, the, the satisfied, the happy slave would score very high on subjective well-being on that account. So these are the standard problems of the subjective accounts, but the objective accounts, which I'm talking about today, I mean, especially the flourishing account, uh, have also got their own problems to deal with, uh, as I sort of foreground in this presentation. Uh, and one of the most standard ones is that it seems a bit paternalistic to tell someone that she is happy externally, just from the outside. So let's say a student, let's say the OECD comes up with a, a measure of uh, flourishing and includes it in the PISA surveys and a student A scores very high on, on flourishing, but then if you, if you interview the student, if you talk to the student, the, the student says that he or she is, is very unhappy with life and even contemplating suicide. So, so that, then it will be very paternalistic to say, well, you scored really high on all these objective measures of uh, flourishing, so you must be enjoying well-being. So this is sort of the standard uh, thing you read about in textbooks about well-being, these sort of standard accounts. Now I'll turn basically to the flourishing accounts and the, the difference between these four groups of people who are promoting them uh, these days in education. And this is a really important slide uh, sort of from an academic point of view. I will talk more about the practice, the practical matters later, but from a, an academic point of view, I, I try to sort of list what I consider to be the main strengths and the weaknesses of each of the four accounts. And in my book, I, although I start out from an Aristotelian premise, because I am a neo-Aristotelian, I try to sort of uh, revise and uh, update and adjust the Aristotelian account to take, to take notice of some of the strengths of the three other accounts. So the, the standard Aristotelian account of flourishing is, is really strong in sort of promoting the moral and rational and communal side of, of flourishing. Uh, focuses a lot on moral, intellectual, and civic virtues. But it doesn't pay much attention to individual purpose or meaning. So Aristotle wouldn't really be able to make sense of Greta Thunberg's sort of, sort of focusing her whole life on, on one, one goal, namely sort of sustainability or environmental issues, because the, the, the idea of individual purpose and meaning didn't really originate until with the Enlightenment. It's not an account that you can really find in antiquity with Aristotle. And Aristotle was also very, very sort of uh, quiet about anything that we would call spiritual or transcendent, uh, because he sort of hated the, the spiritualism of his mentor Plato and wanted to be much more down to earth and practical in everything he said. So if you, if you think that a flourishing account needs to include something sort of high-minded, enchanted, then you won't find that in Aristotle. Now the liberal accounts, are obviously very strong on everything having to do with autonomous activity, with personal purpose and meaning. But on the other hand, they have a problem about accounting for universal character strengths and virtues because they think they don't really exist. Self-determination theory is really strong on psychological needs and motivations to flourish. So for those of you who have read anything about that theory will know that this theory posits three main psychological needs of all human beings for, for competence, for relationships, and for autonomy. Uh, but it doesn't talk, talk much about the human being as a rational animal. Uh, so there is very little about sort of the rational capacities that Aristotle foregrounds. And then finally, positive education, Martin Seligman and, and his colleagues, they, they have sort of advanced the so-called PERMA model, five components of flourishing, positive, positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. Uh, and what they say is, is, is really strong on the personal uh, meaning and the positive emotion side of things, but they do not really sort of 
give philosophers much to bite on. I mean, they, they are not very strong on explaining what is the normative grounding of these components. They only talk about what is generally valued by people. They don't really talk about what is generally valuable. Uh, and also there's a, a bit of a problem uh, in the theory of character strengths and virtues in, in positive psychology. They've got these famous 24 character strengths and virtues, but they don't talk about any integration problems. They don't talk about the possible conflicts between these virtues, which is a major theme in Aristotle. I mean, Aristotle thought that the main problem with the virtues was that they sometimes conflict. I mean, you can't sometimes just be, be both honest and compassionate at the same time. Uh, so he, he talked a lot about phronesis or practical wisdom as the conductor of the whole orchestra, but there is no conductor of the positive psychological orchestra. This is 24 different instrument groups all playing their own tunes. So this is a really, really quick overview of the sort of the academic strengths and weaknesses of these four accounts. So what I try to do in, in my book is to sort of ameliorate the weaknesses in the Aristotelian account and accommodate insights from, from the rest. Uh, but also I try to identify various unsolved problems in, 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 in all of the four accounts and, and offer some kind of a synthesis. Just a really quick note for those of you who sort of question the difference between objective and subjective accounts of well-being. A lot of people say that this difference doesn't really matter in the end because people who are experiencing flourishing, who are experiencing objective well-being will also be happy and, ple and pleased. And, the, and the all the way around, if you, are, if you are really happy and pleased with life, then that's an indication that you are actually leading a flourishing life. Now, in most cases, probably that's true. It, it, this, these, these, thing, these things do go hand in hand most of the time. But in my book, I, I talk sort of in, in quite detail about examples of uh, persons where these two did not go hand in hand. So like Ludwig Wittgenstein, the, the famous philosopher, on his deathbed, he said that he had led a wonderful life. He thought his life had been an extremely flourishing one. But everybody agreed that Wittgenstein was a grumpy uh, man who was seldom pleased. His, his glass was always half empty. He, he didn't experience much pleasure in life, but he considered his life to have been really, really flourishing and, and uh, successful in a way. And then we've got Gauguin, the, the famous Dutch uh, artist who left his family in dire straits to go to Polynesia and have fun with with the women there, uh, seemed to have enjoyed his life a lot, uh, frolicking uh, with lots of mistresses, uh, doing what he enjoyed most, painting. Uh, but if you look at his life in terms of sort of character strengths and virtues and the, the ordinary components of flourishing, it would be very, very strange to say that Gauguin was a, a flourishing person, although he seemed to be very happy with that. So these things do not always go hand in hand. Now the fourth, problem number four, this is related to actually problem number two with all these different groups of educationists uh, all promoting and celebrating flourishing. It's a problem of, of flourishing turning into just some kind of a bland truism. Uh, just, yeah, everybody agrees flourishing is good, but it just becomes like a shopping trolley that everybody can just fill with their own random choice of goods. Uh, so in my book, I, I sort of argue that in order for a, a flourishing account of education to mean anything, you have to specify all the variables uh, with sufficient uh, specificity. So what I do in the book, uh, and I'm not going to go into this in detail here because it would take another hour, is I, I just sort of propose a very, very detailed definition of human flourishing, which is based in Aristotle, but takes account of other theories as well. I'm not even going to read this out. This is, a, this is somebody said to me that this reads like the, the small letter in an insurance contract, uh, which is quite true. Uh, but I think the only way to sort of get to grips with this academically is to sort of look at each of these variables in detail and give examples of how that might, they might play out in, in classroom contexts. So although I do this sort of academically in the book, I also try to sort of be as practical and down to earth as possible. So I, I wrote the book, uh, not only for academics, but also for teachers. And at the end of each chapter, for example, I sort of try to offer some 
reflections for teachers and, and questions for teachers to, to think about uh, if they want to be flourishing, if they want to, if they want to enhance the flourishing of the students. So for those of you who know anything about Aristotle and his theory of flourishing, I, I do go beyond Aristotle in various ways. I think we need to update Aristotle. And actually, I think that's what he would have wanted himself because he always said that he was a naturalist and he believed that all moral theorizing had to be answerable to empirical research. So I, I do think that we need to include in flourishing much more than Aristotle did the idea of enchantment. Uh, I think uh, kids who never experienced goose pimples in the classroom, who never sort of feel enchanted and uplifted by what's being taught, even if it's something really, really awe-inspiring, like literature, Shakespeare or whatever, or sort of something natural science about the nature of the universe. I think if they don't experience sort of some kind of enchantment in the classroom, at least from time to time, I think there is something wrong with the teaching. It's not flourishing, enhancing. Secondly, I think we need to make some kind of room for radical psychomoral conversions fairly late in life. For Aristotle, your character is basically more or less set in stone uh, as a teenager, and he doesn't really believe in, in, in the, the possibility of people uh, at what we would now call the college level or, or older people Sort of having any sort of big psychomoral conversions or Damascus experiences. I think we need to update that. I think in order to have a, a good theory of flourishing, we need to make room for uh, moral conversions. And also, I think we are actually living in the 21st century. We're not learn, living in Athens, and we need to take account of the modern conception of a personal sense of meaning as well. We need to be able to make sense of Greta Thunberg leading a flourishing life with her sort of uh, having chosen a fairly narrow purpose for her life, but one which is still morally uh, commendable. And then finally, I, I am less demanding than Aristotle. Aristotle thought that in order to lead a flourishing life, you had to actualize the virtues, the moral virtues and the civic virtues and the intellectual virtues. And not only that, you also had to enjoy them. So it's a bit like with food, I mean, he, he said, you don't only need to eat broccoli, you need to enjoy the taste of broccoli as well. Uh, I don't think that, I think that's a bit too demanding. I think in some cases, it's quite enough for us to learn to, to engage in some pro-social behaviors without necessarily sort of enjoying it all the time. Sometimes we have to force ourselves to do good. I think there's, don't think there's anything wrong with that from a, a flourishing perspective. So, so in these four ways, I mean, I, I, I want to go beyond the Aristotle. But I think that the basic, one of the, the, the most basic problems with, with Aristotle's account is that it's very, very flat and disenchanted, like I said. It's, it doesn't sort of take account of any spiritual or transcendent experiences of the true good and the beautiful. Uh, but I think people have a deep need for that, and I would even argue that a lot of young people's experimentation with drugs has, has particularly to do with their search for something higher, for something sort of beyond the ordinary in, in life. And I think we have to sort of try to try to satisfy these needs in the classroom. And like I said, it's, it's really, really sad to read empirical research showing that most uh, students in elementary and high school, at elementary and high school level in Europe and, and actually in Asia as well, say that they hardly ever experience flow in the classroom and let alone any boost pimples about something really uplifting that they are being taught. In this way, actually, Confucianism is, is, is a bit more uh, open-minded than the Aristotelian view of flourishing. Uh, for those of you who know anything about Chinese philosophy, there's a lot of sort of aesthetic appreciation and, and sort of, there are a lot of goose pimples in, in the Confucian way of thinking about flourishing. So I do think that the Aristotelian model can be improved in some ways, although I'm not a a great fan of Martin Seligman's theory in general, but I do think that his focus on positive emotions and meaning in the PERMA model, they do add something to the, the old Aristotelian account of flourishing and, uh, and awe and elevation are actually among the 24 character strengths. So what can teachers do about enchantment? Many, many teachers say, well, I don't really know how to, how to 
uh, and sound students in, in the classroom. I think teachers should try as, as much as they can to expose students to experiences where students come into contact with ideals of truth, beauty, and goodness. Uh, I think literature is an underused uh, resource in education. Yes, students do read a lot of literature, but the way it's taught is mainly just about style and facts and figures. Uh, the, the, the opportunity is missed to use literature as uh, a springboard for discussions about what is the good life, uh, what are the emotions that these people are experiencing, and would you have done the same, would you have felt the same? So there's a lot of opportunities lost, I think, in ordinary classrooms uh, in the way literature is being taught, and even more so for science. I mean, it's incredible that 95% of students say they never experience any enchantment in physics classes, even when learning about, you know, the, the infinity of the universe or, or the stars, etc. There's something wrong in the way these things are, are taught. Uh, there's lack of aesthetic ecstasy and, and intellectual elevation, unfortunately, in, in most classrooms around the world. And I think that is a, a problem for flourishing. Just a, a quick words on, on the notion of meaning, which I, I pointed out earlier, is something we need to add to the old accounts, be they Aristotelian or Confucian, because the uh, idea of personal meaning is, a, is an 18th century ideal. Uh, and I, I just want to recommend this wonderful book by William Damon and his research into student meaning, uh, The Path to Purpose. And his findings, at least for US, young students between the age of 12 and 26 are quite, quite depressing. But only 20% of them really felt that they had any purpose with their studies or in their life in general. And 25% of them were completely disengaged. They didn't see any, any purpose in what they were learning in the classroom, and they didn't feel that their life had any, any higher meaning either. And I think it would be really, really useful to sort of uh, replicate this resource in, in different countries around the world. I also want to say something about the external necessity for flourishing, and this is an area where Aristotle actually is extremely strong. Uh, so uh, a lot of theories of flourishing, you can see this in Confucianism and Stoicism and Buddhism and, and various other uh, philosophies, they seem to be saying, telling us that if the person is really good, morally good, then nothing can harm that person, nothing can harm the really good person. And Aristotle has nothing but scorn for this view. He says, this is nonsense. I mean, if, if you see somebody who's being tortured, uh, even if the person is, is morally good, you can't really point to the person who's being tortured uh, on the torture wheel and say, well, this person is, is flourishing just because he is, he's a good person. That's nonsense, he says. We need all kinds of external necessities, political, uh, societal, cultural, uh, and we need, like Aristotle said, we need a, uh, an ethos, a, uh, an environment, a family, uh, uh, a state uh, with good government, etc., uh, to lead good flourishing lives. So this is not just about fixing the kids. This is a really important point. Flourishing in schools is not just about fixing individual kids. That is a very sort of neoliberal take on, on flourishing, which uh, I and other Aristotelians are very much uh, against. Uh, but what does that mean for the ordinary teacher? I mean, if, if, if children need a lot of external necessities to, to flourish, uh, then we know that at least 20% of children in the world don't have these necessities. They, they, can't, they either don't go to school at all, or they, they go to schools which are sort of under-resourced. Uh, and this is a really interesting, it's an interesting debate which has taken place about this. Uh, and you can see how, how two highly moralized people disagree on this. Elizabeth Campbell is a famous teacher educator in Canada. She thinks that the teacher only has obligations towards his, his or her own class. Uh, the, the, the duty of the teacher is to try to promote the flourishing of the class or the students that uh, he or she is teaching. Whereas Alistair McIntyre, the, the famous Scottish philosopher, thinks that by becoming a teacher, you are sort of taking on a vocation of promoting flourishing for all children all over the world. And you should be a, a, an, an agent of, of social change. Uh, 
to be fighting uh, for the rights of, of children all over the world. But he also says that because this is basically a hopeless endeavor in today's capitalist world, the job of being a teacher for him is a, is a tragic profession. So, so it's a very sort of sad, uh, in a way, conclusion from, from Marketing point of view. And as I often do in the book, I, I try to find some kind of a middle ground proposal between these two uh, views. Uh, and then a practical question. So, right, if we agree that uh, schools should become institutions that promote general flourishing among students, what does that mean for the curriculum? Uh, and again, we have really different views from, from these different educationists. So the most radical view is the one by John White, the liberal educationist. He thinks that a, a focus on flourishing in schools requires nothing less than sort of completely revamping the, the curriculum. He thinks the current timetable in schools all over the world is completely outdated and old fashioned and sort of based on 18th century, 19th century ideas about how to carve up academic subjects. Uh, he thinks it's remarkable that if you look at the timetable of a student today, it looks very similar to a timetable of a student who went to a school in, at the end of the 19th century. There is one hour in English and another hour in maths and another hour in in natural science, and then they do some sport, etc. Yeah, they we, we, we have added something called IT, but apart from that, the timetable looks very similar. He thinks you need to scrap all of this, and instead, education should be thematically organized. So when the kids go to school on a Monday morning, there should be one hour about sustainability, there should be one hour about world peace, there should be one hour about uh, the nature of the universe, etc or global warming, so everything should be art, art organized thematically, and then you get different experts coming in to talk about these themes, but he thinks the only way to change schools into flourishing institutions is to, as I said, completely change the timetable. Now, are teachers ready for this role, becoming flourishing facilitators rather than ordinary teachers? Unfortunately, if we interview them, they say no. So most teachers when interviewed, and there's a lot of research on this from all over the world, they say that their teacher training hasn't really prepared them. Not only, not even for, to be character educators, let alone flourishing facilitators. So they, they, they point out that this is gonna require considerable change in the way teaching, teacher training is, is organized. Right, so uh, this is my last slide. So, just to summarize, until recently, flourishing or eudaimonia was not discussed that much in educational circles, apart from a few sort of eccentric uh, philosophers who, who read Aristotle. Uh, but then in the last 10 to 20 years, we got this sort of suddenly a, a bandwagon of, of educators from various quarters talking about uh, flourishing. And whether we like it or not, I think a lot of that goes down to the work by positive psychology. So even if you don't, even if you don't like positive psychology as such, then we can't reject the fact that they have brought this topic to the agenda. Uh, and at the moment, as I said, it's not only the philosophers and the psychologists who are talking about this, it's becoming a hot topic among educationists and educators. And I mentioned to you that OECD is discussing this and they have called me to some other meetings and trying to sort of look for some ways to put this into, into surveys as, a, as an instrument. Now, we know that the history of educational thought is a history of facts. Uh, ideas come and ideas go. And teachers say, well, this is, this is a hot topic today, but it will be forgotten tomorrow. We know that some academic trends become abortive while others continue to soldier on. So uh, I am a great believer in this uh, ideal of human flourishing. And if you share my general view, my general positive view on, on flourishing, I hope that you can help us to move the flourishing discourse forward in, and help us to make it enrich educational policy and, and practice. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much for that. Questions in the chat, or is somebody going to sort of? Uh...
Um, I can take some live questions here. And for those who don't get around to that right now, um, yeah, they're, they're welcome to reach out to you uh, either in the document or through some other means we have available through the conference. Um, so, yeah, let's see. Anastasia. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for this uh, very thought provoking talk. Uh, uh, it was very interesting to, to, to kind of hear from you the overview of the book. Um, uh, very helpful. And um, it's just something that um, has been puzzling me over the last few years on <laughs> this topic of eudaimonia. And uh, that's a very a great opportunity for me to ask you as an expert what your thoughts are on this term being maybe not the right term for what it's trying to measure uh, and understand. And uh, as you very well pointed, a few problematic areas um, that summarize my thoughts in a way, and there may be more. And, my thoughts were always uh, knowing a little bit about Aristotle. Uh, my thoughts were always that this is not a term for psychology, um, and just a, a just a one uh, very let's say basic <laughs> argument would be that Aristotle uh, considered eudaimonia to be only um, let's say appreciated or be measured in a way. Uh, just before the moment of death because anything can happen until the last minute and I think he gives an example of someone who's been flourishing throughout his life and just a few moments before he dies something terrible happens <clears throat> and everything collapses so would you call this man a eudaimonic man and he says no because just before he dies everything changed so my thoughts were always that this is not the right term and maybe we could use that flourishing that sounds quite appropriate so i was wondering what your thoughts were on that or anyone else's thank you yeah i mean there's always a big problem about terminology and translation so uh, there have been so many different translations of eudaimonia into into english uh, people don't agree about this some people simply call it happiness and all just call it objective well-being etc so Flourishing seems to sort of be, be catching on uh, for some reason uh, among people from different sort of academic backgrounds. Whether it's exactly the right term is 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 a, is a sort of a, a tricky question. Uh, regarding the the measurement of flourishing, I mean, flourishing. Aristotle did not think of flourishing as a, a state. He thought of it as an ongoing activity. So I don't think Aristotle would have seen anything wrong with sort of taking the temperature or somebody's flourishing at the age of 15 or 20 or whatever, just to see what, what is this people, person's status on, on flourishing at that point in time. So there's nothing wrong with that in principle, but he did say on the other hand, and I think that's quite in accordance with ordinary intuitions and ordinary uses as well. That I mean, even if you let a really, really good life, I mean, you can at some point in time, I mean, take a horribly wrong decision. I mean, you can commit murder or, or you can sort of, you know, uh, be responsible for a terrible car accident, you know, where you, where you are not cautious enough, and and then everything sort of you, you achieved in your life so far is is destroyed. So he's just basically pointing this out that you can never rest on your laurels. I mean, it doesn't really matter if you've done everything right. I mean, you've been extremely successful in your life. You can't just rest on your laurels when you're 60 and say, well, now I've led a, a flourishing life because you could still make some drastic mistakes. And uh, and I do think that. I mean, as I said, I think that understanding is, is quite in accordance with sort of ordinary people's understanding of, of happiness or, or well-being. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, unfortunately, we, like I said, we don't have time for, for many questions between these things, but um, um, yeah, I direct you again to the Google Docs or to reach out individually or to start a conversation on Slack. Um, so let's thank uh, Professor Christensen again.